So let me make this work real quick. I am really excited to be here. Does it work? Can you guys hear me in the back? No? Yes. yes. OK. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Probably, I'm way more excited to be here than you guys are. I'm positive of that. Um, a little under a year ago, I was at a networking event, and I told somebody, it was this guy who wanted to inspire like everyone he met. And he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I laughed, and I thought it would be funny to tell him this, um, like this long shot dream I have. And I said, I would like to, um, I'd like to be a public speaker. And I love to have just captive audiences all the time, and they just have to sit and listen to whatever I want to say, like whatever I want to talk about. And uh, so I don't think it gets any more captive than this. Like you're literally incentivized by grades, and you paid to be here. So you can graduate and get a degree. It's like, it's perfect. Um, and I, when I got the invitation to, to speak, I, lit, I laughed out loud. Um, and then I called my husband, and he laughed even harder. Uh, is this a tech entrepreneurship lecture series? Yes. Okay. I worked at Qualtrics. It's a tech company. And I did, I sat with the engineers while they built a product that I was implementing. Um, that was like the beginnings of my experience in, in tech. But I married a techie. And so I'm surrounded by tech, but I would not say that I'm the person you should put up on a stage and talk about tech entrepreneurship. Uh, so I laughed because I could think of 20 other people who have been in the grind and have been working and slaving in entrepreneurship to provide for their families. So um, I'm really excited to be here because on the plus side, I have spoken to a lot of tech entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general, and I am really excited to share with you what I've learned. So the reason I am here is because Doug and I together started a podcast. It's called Married to a Startup, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit behind <coughs> why we started that podcast, uh, but first I'll just tell you kind of what it is. Uh, we interview entrepreneurs and their spouses. And we, Doug and I sit in the same room as them, and we ask them questions about their experiences building a business. And what our, our purpose is, is to kind of get beyond the highlights where you raise 30 million, and then you slave for a few years, and then you had a huge exit, and now you have millions of dollars, and you travel the world. Um, we, those stories are really exciting and, and very inspiring. Um, and I think they have their place. But as a spouse of an entrepreneur, I, I have felt like I wanted to hear about those gaps in between the $30 million raise and the, or, or the idea and then the 10-year gap and then the $30 million raise. So we try to ask about their experiences together. So tell us about your experiences, like what happened when you pitched the idea to your wife? Did she like the idea? Did she laugh you out of the room? And things like that. So uh, the reason I'm here is to share with you what we've learned in those experiences. Um, and I'm a big advocate for having the, the spouse talk to me like, about their experiences because I have been historically the spouse in our relationship. And I still feel, I don't know that I'm an entrepreneur yet, but I talk to lots of them. Uh, so it's ironic that Doug isn't here, right here with me, giving this presentation because we built this podcast together. And I told him the other night, I said, he, he asked if I had thought about including him, I think. And I was really honest with him. And this is super immature, so I know that. And it's before, disclaimer, it's really immature. I said, Doug, I know you'll have opportunities to speak to people. You always have crazy ideas and great stories. People want to hear what you have to say. But no one's ever asked me what I have to say. And I really want to tell them what I have to say. And so I was like, I really just want this opportunity for myself, selfishly. And it was hard to hear myself say the words out loud, but it was true, it was how I felt. And then today it came and my presentation wasn't done, the PowerPoint wasn't done, and I had added this with notable support from Doug Leonard, like thinking I was funny, because I'm always talking about how like, the, or the spouse doesn't get the credit they deserve. But literally, Doug, I, I literally could not have had this stupid PowerPoint put together without him today because the baby got an ear infection and I chose to clean the kitchen a few nights ago instead of working on it and I procrastinated. 
And so he was sitting with me. We're both on laptops. He's like making these clips work for us. So anyway, this what I the reason I'm sharing that with you is just um, that that is my own humbling. Like as much as I'm an advocate for the spouse, today I had the most humbling experience of realizing I don't even know what I'm talking about, and I don't preach what I or walk the talk. So anyway. Doug helped a lot with this. He should be up here with me, and he is a, the reason I'm up here as well. So I'll include him in the Q&A. How about that? Yeah, you can ask. He, part of the reason I told him, too, is that his stories are so distracting, like Crypto Kitties. He just told me, to keep them awake, you can offer Crypto Kitties for answering their, your questions. It's a cryptocurrency and blockchain. It's a thing. Um, and anyway, but he, I was like, if you get up on the stage, they're going to forget that I exist. Like, they're not going to. So anyway, I'll go ahead and start with my presentation. So this is background on how, um, how our lives in marriage and entrepreneurship are, is, and then also in what led to the podcast. So here's what I imagined in life and in marriage. So I imagine girl meets boy, they fall madly in love, and they decide to get married. And it's like pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy going until that point. And then they both finish, their, uh, finish college, by which time the boy has found a career uh, that he loves. And uh, they go on to their secure job. And, uh, and then I, and I'm not saying, I'm, this is not me stereotyping all women. This is just my plan. I would nurture our kids at home while working on projects of my own on the side when I had time. And then I would support my husband completely in his career, like little perfect cheerleader. And we would live happily ever after. And then also an alternate ending that I was okay with was he makes loads of money in his secure job. And then we decide to leave the secure job with our loads of savings and start a business with no risk because we're rich. So I was, those were kind of, that was what I was imagining playing out in my mind. And to give you a background on who I am, where I came from. Um, I am from a hick town. So the, uh, the student number here at BYU is higher than the town I came from. And so I didn't come from riches. And so I didn't expect to be super wealthy. But it was like, I mean, I could probably meet the bar that I grew up with and maybe exceed it a little bit. So that was the plan. And this is how it's played out so far. So. I met Doug, an entrepreneur, and decided to marry him. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience dating, but we both have very strong personalities, and so we had our things that we, were, that we butted heads on, but we were excited to get married. Um, at the time that I was dating him, his entrepreneurship, uh, his entrepreneurial spirit was a bit muted. He was trying to get into the information system here at BYU. Uh, information systems program here at BYU and he figured that he that was a hard skill that he could have and then apply in entrepreneurship and so he was focusing on that focusing on getting in and so he did share that he had started a t-shirt company before we met and that he had had these fun little escapades beforehand but it wasn't present so I didn't really see him as this wild wild entrepreneur when before we got married uh, and then we get to the point where I'm supposed to be the perfect cheerleader, and I really struggled to support him in his entrepreneurial dreams. So one of the first things that happens, we're early married. He's in the junior core. I barely see him because the junior core is really hard. And I apologize about that. <laughs> it made my first year of, your, year of marriage very difficult. Um, so... He, I don't see him super often. He's studying all the time. And while he's studying, he's hanging out with these buddies. And they are talking about fun tech things. And he comes home and he says, Chan, I think I want to max out my student loans. And I want to use them to buy some, block, uh, some Bitcoin miners. And I said, well, what is the chance of like return on these Bitcoin miners? And he was like, no, I don't know. But it will be really great. And we will learn a lot. And I just looked at him like, you're a crazy person. We don't need to take out money that we won't <laughs> like for sure make a gu guaranteed return on. I think you're insane. And that was just kind of the beginning of this 
gap in differences of our perspective on risk taking. So it became apparent that was one of the first times. My risk tolerance is about, I don't know, what do you think it is? It's like a 2.5 on the scale of 400. <laughs> so I was going to say a 3 out of 10. <laughs> Doug's is a 400 on a scale of 400. If he could get a, a good story out of it, he'll risk anything, really. And uh, I think it's a great trait for an entrepreneur ha to have, and I don't have it. And as a spouse, it was a little bit awkward because he was like, let's do these crazy things, and it'll be great, and we'll have so much fun. And I was like, yeah, I don't think we should do that at all. No, we should stay home, and you should get a secure job. And it will be really fun, just <laughs> wait and see. I'll make it real great, I'm good at cooking. And I actually wasn't good at cooking, so that wasn't even something I could offer getting better. Um, so I'll fast forward a little bit. I don't want to make this too long, but this is our story. Uh, so Doug was, had an opportunity to be a chapter director for Startup Grind. And in your events that you have to go to for this class, you hear entrepreneurs share their successful stories. That was the type of event that Startup Grind is, and it, it's now in Salt Lake. So we would, he would interview successful entrepreneurs. And one of those entrepreneurs was Johnny Hanna, and so it was that caliber of entrepreneur. And so we'd go and sit, and I'd go with him. I didn't, we didn't have any kids, no reason for me not to go and support him. And we'd listen to their stories, and we'd both leave super hyped. And it was kind of like, man, we could do this. We could make this work. Like, entrepreneurship works. Did you see him? Like, he's a great guy. He's a down-to-earth guy, and he has a business, and he started it from his basement. Like, we could do that. And so I started to catch on to this idea of entrepreneurship. I started to get a little bit more uh, comfortable with the idea. And, but I still sat there in those events and listening to them speak. And they'd say, yeah, and then I, we just took out a double mortgage on the house, or a second mortgage on the house. And then, and then we invested it into more employees and it worked and now we're exiting. And, it was, and I'd look at them and I'd think, but like, did your wife just say like, yeah, let's get a second mortgage on the house. That's a really good idea. Like, or did you have to pitch it for two weeks and finally convince her? Or did you just have to, did she just trust you? And so um, I love the events. They were really good for me. I still felt like I, there was more story than I needed because we'd, we'd go home, hype from the events. A week later, Doug would pitch an idea to me and I'd be like, uh, yeah, I know that that's what the other guy did, and I know that he made millions, but I think we're different, and I don't think you should make that, take that risk. I think that's a bad idea. So as much as I was starting to get more comfortable with it, it was still hard to support him in what he wanted to pursue. So during school, he started a company with his buddies in the information systems program, and it was convenient because they all knew how to code, so they didn't have to pay anyone, and they could use it as our capstone project. And if you pitch an idea to me, and you tell me it's for your degree, I mean, I can't say no to that, because the degree is hopefully leading me to my secure job. So, uh, <laughs> so Doug got, got through with that company and that idea, and they had a lot of fun building it, and they participated in the Miller New Venture Challenge, and they were able to go to the, um, the BYU launch pad. Is that what it's called? For that next summer afterwards. And during the summer, they worked on it, and they had so much fun. And it was really fun to watch him do it. But they, uh, actually, they didn't do it during the summer. No, they paid Doug's brother, too. Because they all decided for their families they were going to get a secure job. And so I was a little bit excited about that, to be honest, because I was starting to really want kids. And I thought, if you start on this road, I don't know when I'll get kids. And so I kind of was feeling protective about that and feeling like Qualtrics was really a great experience, but that I was ready to move on. And so we, he started working at Weave, a, a startup in Lehigh, and, uh, and he really enjoyed it. Um, it was a good experience for him. Uh, but for about a year and a half, we both worked super hard. We were never home. When we were home, I mean, it was 9 to 5, but also after work. It kept us working late sometimes. And uh, we just bought things. 
like Doug would go to, we'd come home, we'd be like, dirt, we're just so tired, but we'd want to do something fun, but we couldn't be very creative, so we'd just go to Hobby Town, and we bought like <laughs> these two, actually like six, uh, remote control cars, and we just started like inviting friends over and racing remote control cars. So and they're $800 remote control cars. They're $800 remote control cars. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't easy to pitch me on, but we were just so <coughs> tired from what we were doing that we just like, it just, we were looking for fun. And so we bought those, we just did random things with our time. And it was fun, but it was just, it wasn't, we didn't progress a whole lot. Um, it was like any progression we had, we purchased and it has its place, but it, it wasn't super satisfying. So eventually Maisie came towards the end of that a year, year and a half where we just had a double income and bought random things all the time. And uh, Maisie came, I went back to Qualtrics part time to make sure that I didn't want to keep working. I didn't want to keep working. So I stopped about three months afterwards, right after Doug had been laid off from Weave. Uh, one of the pros to working at a startup is that it's great. One of the cons is that you can get laid off <laughs> uh, and it happens and it's something you have to plan for. So luckily, because we had been uh, working double income, somehow, actually I know exactly how, we had money saved up. I was saving, Doug, and we were spending together sometimes. He was buying cryptocurrency when it was failing, and I thought he was a psycho. Um, and I do love my husband. I had thought he's, I do think he's a psycho a lot of the time. Um, so we, we had money saved up and we decided, you know what, we know what it's like to make a double income. It, it was good, but it wasn't great and we'd like to progress more in our lives beyond just like the progression in corporate world. So um, let's, take as, let's take our savings, let's make sure we keep a buffer and let's try to make some money as entrepreneurs um, before our money runs out. And so that has been the last about a year of our lives is this entrepreneurial exploration. And it's been really enjoyable and we have not made any money. No, that's not true. We've made some money, but not sustainable money. But it has been like the happiest year of our lives and, um, and it was really uh, a great time for us to learn to start working together. So. That leads me to the podcast. So as we started working together and Doug learned that if he included me in the planning, in the idea that I could, I was a lot more comfortable with, with these ideas that he would have. And so we got kind of excited about learning to work together and, and we had time. And so I said, so Doug thinks is his idea, the podcast, it was my idea. <laughs> so we, I, uh, someone said, let's do this now. Let's make the podcast. And, and what it became was because podcasts, the way we were doing it, do cost money, it became an investment. So we decided we know we want to try to have entrepreneurship as our lifestyle, as our career. Um, we know that family is important and we don't ever want to <coughs> sacrifice that. Let's talk to entrepreneurs who have done that who have not sacrificed their families and find out um, how they did it. And so the podcast was born and uh, we are continuing to invest. And at this point, Doug has gotten, he decided he wanted to learn to uh, blockchain things. <laughs> I'm a really good spouse because I know what he's doing. And um, he, so he has started, he's joined a startup recently for blockchain called Mainframe. And it's really exciting. Again, working for startups, I think, offer experiences that are, that are really valuable as well. So we're excited to have him there. So, but we are continuing this on the side. And basically, again, it's just an investment in our learning. So now is the exciting part, I think, of my time chatting with you. I would like to include you a little bit in the conversation and then share what we've learned from entrepreneurs who have built businesses and families and are building businesses and families. And these are some really high caliber couples. We 
would not have had the opportunity to chat with them ever because you don't just call someone and say, I'm Chandler Leonard, and they're like, yeah, I know who you are. What can I do for you? It's like, okay, who are you? Why are you talking to me? So um, we would never have had the opportunity to chat with them if it hadn't been for the podcast. So it's been a great investment, and I'm excited to share what we're going with you. So uh, then what I'm going to do is have show you a question, and then we're going to chat a little bit about what you think, and then I'll share some clips that we've had from the podcast. One thing that we've learned is that every couple is different. I'm up here and I'm saying that my husband's a psycho. Our best friends, uh, he has a business, Trace, and he's had it for a few years, and she is 100% supportive. She doesn't question, I won't say she doesn't question anything he does, but she questions very little of what he does. She's very good at saying, you know what's best, I'm gonna follow your lead. And I'm not good at that which is why I'm up here <laughs> not sharing my time with my husband. So what I'm trying to say is anything that you share in, as an answer to these questions, to me is a valid answer. Every couple is different. Um, every person is different. And really quickly, I wanted to ask this, but I forgot to ask it before. How many of you are married? Cool. How many of you are dating someone that you're considering marrying? I thought that'd be a fun one to ask, especially if like, both of you are in the class, just make an awkward situation. Um, how many of you are planning to be entrepreneurs? Awesome. Okay. Uh, so I want to hear from like all of you, even if you're not married. I've been married for a really long time, so everything I say is super valid. But you might have some really good thoughts, too. So. Um, I've been married for five years. I'm an expert. Uh, okay, so how do you decide whether or not to pursue a business idea? So your spouse comes to you, or you go to your spouse, and you say, we should do this. What criteria do you use to decide whether or not that's a good idea for yourself? Yeah. We're both interested. Okay. That's if she's not, then it's not going to work out. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I guess I'm more data driven, so I'd have to be like, you know, specs on it. Is it different, better, or is it special than anything else? Okay, cool. Kind of like a VC approach to it. Yeah, okay. I would ask if there's a need for it, if there's actually a demand for something like that. Okay. Yeah. If she likes it, then she's right. <laughs> that is the spouse that I am not. <laughs> but I'm glad that you are. <laughs> That's awesome. Any, anything else? Is there anything that you might think of in the arena of like goals in your life that it needs to make sure to protect and push you towards a certain goal? Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it should Mm -hmm. It's a good idea to have market research and prove that like, you're, you're completely behind it, but you're not going to spend every dime you have. Mm -hmm. so you guys will subscribe and probably a good indication that you need to Okay. Yeah, I like that. Not every dime you have. I think that um, you can't sacrifice what is important to you. So, like, for you, you understand that for some people it would be like their car or a house. Mm -hmm. or Yeah, I, I really like that. We had an experience recently. Uh, Doug and I both come from very, um, just like middle class families. We were very comfortable growing up, but we were by no means the wealthiest people on the block. Um, I shared my block with my grandparents and their horses, so we actually were. But that was because they were, were retired <laughs> and didn't have a retirement. <laughs> um, so, so, anyway, the point is, um, <laughs> we had an experience where another entrepreneur came into our apartment. We've been living in an apartment, a basement apartment, um, since pretty much since we were married. Um, it has, no one's living upstairs, it's got a great backstory. 
um, but that has allowed us to live there longer and we've got a great backyard and things like that. But inside uh, the house, we, I think it's comfortable. Um, there's always been a question like, is there mold that we're breathing in every day? Um, but we like are both pretty satisfied with it and neither one of us is feeling bitter that we still live there. And we had another entrepreneur come into our house and he was, he's made money doing entrepreneurial things and he looked at us and he was like, so like, is it important to you to have a nice house at all or like nice decorations or nice furniture? And Doug and I looked at each other and we were like, N no, because <laughs> clearly like it's not a first priority. But it was for him. That was really important to him. And so everyone is different in that regard. And I think where you're deciding with a spouse what idea to pursue, um, it's really important to forget anything that anyone else has done and just talk about what you feel important. Um, similarly, I require a car for myself, um, separate of the car that Doug has. And I've had a car since I was 16, and it's just something that I really need. You can put me in a house that maybe has mold in it, but I need my own car. So there's, everyone's gonna have those things that they need, and so chatting with your spouse, I think, is a great way to move forward on whether or not to pursue it, a business idea. So here is what... Um, the way you approach it. Thought, have I? Here's what, so Johnny Hanna spoke to your class a few days ago, or not a few days ago, a few weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, yeah, whenever it was. This is his wife uh, talking Paige. about Paige, mm -hmm, who's one of my favorite aunt spouses that I've ever talked to. She's hilarious. Um, this is her sharing what her thoughts were as uh, Johnny pitched Homey, their second company, to her. I'm shooting for the stars, and I'm going to get paid, but this is the one I want to do. <laughs> and, you know, that came, how many years? Nine years into marriage? And I think what was awesome about that is that we had that conversation after we learned so much. If we had that conversation when we were first married, I didn't know him well enough to really trust that that was going to be the case. Right. So I'm grateful that that's where it was. And I... For the newlyweds that have that same approach, do you trust that your spouse is going to work hard to provide for you? Yeah. Do you support them? All right. You let them shoot the stars, and you just do better. That was a that was really fun for me to hear uh, because that was something I think I needed to learn as a spouse. Uh, the criteria for pages at this point in our lives, and I have another clip to back this up that talks about some boundaries that they did set. But her criteria was, do you, pro do you trust that your, your spouse is going to provide for you? And I think uh, as a spouse, do we have any spouses of entrepreneurs in this class by raise of hands? Awesome. <laughs> um, for, for me to hear her say that, uh, I think that there is a lot of power that can come from having, um, from having just trust as an entrepreneur. I think... If you can establish that with your spouse, you have flexibility to do a lot of really amazing things. Um, so this is Johnny talking a little bit more about the boundaries that they did set when uh, Homey was created. Is, there, is that a question? No, I was just going to say real quick. Yeah. Just because you asked that. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that has helped me trust him um, has been his um, ability to listen to my thoughts and my ideas. You know, kind of like, even if he has this big shoot for the stars idea, um, he listens to my concerns. And I think for those in this room who are going to get from the who uh -huh. have their spouse listen to their ideas, I just think that that's important to not, not, I mean, as a spouse of an entrepreneur, you should not limit them. Right? Mm -hmm. At least try your best not to. Like she said, support them, especially if you trust them. But as entrepreneurs, you want to listen to your spouse and show them that you care what they think. And maybe they have some good ideas that can contribute to, to your 
Yeah, totally. I love that. So there is, it's a two-way street. You can trust them, but they can make it easier to be trusted as well. Yeah, and they should show that they trust you too, even though you may not be the entrepreneur Yeah, totally. I love that. I love that a lot. Uh, and I wish, I wasn't able to pull a clip, but, um, but we have, we've interviewed couples where uh, the spouse is, so for instance, Jill Krishnamurthy, I don't know if she spoke to you this last semester. Last semester. Last semester. So she has a company called Duo Venues. She's a fantastic entrepreneur and a fantastic, fantastic financial mind. So she studied finance here at BYU. Um, and her husband is from India and is a chef. And I love that they were talking and he was talking about how he, if he needs to write a, um, a nice email, he asks Jill for help. If she needs to write a more firm, not as nice email, she asks Sintel for help. And that was just one example of how, even though they're from totally different worlds, it may be easy to say, well, my spouse has no, no idea what I'm doing here. They included each other and it benefited them both in both directions. So this is Johnny talking about Maybe boundaries. Seven hours. I mean, I was a mom and she said, like, I want to eat home at 6 every night. You know, I want to use some time with the kids. I said, do you have to sacrifice a family to do this stuff? And, and I wanted the honest answer because we've heard so many times, well, I, if I don't put in all these hours, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Or I have to put in these hours because I'm providing the income for all of these other families. And I, my family is non negotiable. And if he could give me an honest yes, I can go into this and still have marriage and still have a wonderful relationship with our kids, that's all I want. And he said he did. Yeah, I, I felt pretty confident being able to do that. I knew that if I didn't hoard the equity and just keep everything to myself, you know, if, I, if I were to do that, I would have to wear every hat. Yeah. So he goes on to say that he surrounded himself with people who were going to work hard and, uh, and so that he could keep what was sacred to him, which was his time with his family. And uh, I love this. So he talks about being home at six and he does go back to work after the kids are in bed. Uh, but he, but like Johnny has, I don't know if you're familiar with Entrada. Um, it was a very successful company in the valley and, is, and still is. He helped build that and he's building now what appears to be a very successful and revolutionary startup in the valley. This is an, like he is taking time for his family and it is not hurting his businesses. In fact, he would argue it is helping his businesses. And I just love them as an example because I think it's hard to argue that well, I can't have both. I can't have a successful business and be spending time or making, setting those boundaries uh, because I don't, Johnny did. So it seems like it can work if you want it to work. Um, so how do you decide when to bring kids into the picture? So you're, you're an entrepreneur. You're trying to build your business. How do you decide when to have kids? It's an easy question, so you can all... Just raise your hand. And again, this I don't think there's any wrong answer for the record. I'm not looking for a right one. Yeah? I feel like it almost has nothing to do with where the business is at. It's more of your, like where your marriage is at and where you're at as a person. Perfect. Awesome. I like that. Is there anyone here who feels like there's a certain time in a business or in your life when you should introduce kids or like is the ideal time to introduce kids? Yeah. I don't think this is for everyone, but my wife figured, my wife and I figured that life would just get harder as time went on. So we have a kid now and we want to keep that. In awesome. And you're making it work? Yeah. <laughs> Good. The way I asked that question was awkward. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't feel like there's ever really a good time to start having kids because there's always going to be conflict with school or your family or whatever. Uh -huh. So it's really just the decision that you make with your spouse and with the Lord to decide what that's going to be. Awesome. I feel like the recurring theme here is, uh, that is and, and maybe I'm projecting the recurring theme on you, but 
uh, if you and your spouse are on the same page, then, then that's a good time to move forward. Um, because there's not going to be an ideal time that is set. Um, we, Doug and I, uh, Doug really wanted to have a, a startup started, I think, and in a good place before we had kids. And um, I was not born with patience as a virtue. Um, and I, one year, like w one day to the next, I was ready to be patient, didn't need kids right away. And then the next day I was like, Doug, it's time. And I was super persistent and uh, there was conflict as a result. And I'm not now super proud of how much I pushed him. But what became apparent to me from that experience, and that experience was probably a few months of me saying, um, but what about today? And me saying, that's great, the business is going so well, maybe we should have kids. <laughs> Uh, at like any good thing that ever happened, business or not business. Um, what became apparent to me was that we are much more powerful together when we both are on the same page. And when we are not and like actively not being on the same page, it's really difficult to move forward in any arena. Um, we ended up having Maisie, I think four years after we were married. And for, uh, so there are some people around us, it was kind of like, that's forever, like that's too long, clearly. Um, but for us, ultimately, it, in advising our kids, the length of time doesn't matter, but when you're on the same page with your spouse, that's, that's the ideal time, because when you both have your mind set to it together, then you'll make whatever needs to work work. Um, here are two clips. Is the, is, that clock, seven minutes left. Okay, I'm just gonna stop talking and start playing clips. In the family, one thing I learned when Johnny quit is that every problem, every joy, everything he experienced with Entrada was gone. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the memories were gone. The relationships, a lot of clients, you know, all those were gone. But what was the same was our marriage and our family. And one thing I was grateful we had about all of our family memories during it. If he had devoted that entire time just to the business, when he left it, we'd be starting from scratch getting to know each other, or him getting to know his kids. Yeah. But because we had the family unit and the work unit, when one was gone, we still had the other. So going into homey, I did have those fears of, oh, what if we have a baby and things aren't, you know, things are more rocky and then, yeah. you know, pregnancy, I have a patient and I, and I can't give him what he needs to support him. In a startup. But then I reassured myself of the things I've previously learned, which is that this is what matters. So that was a page talking about deciding to have their last little baby girl right as they were uh, starting on Homey. And they decided, or she decided that it was the family, one thing I learned more from important to have the baby. Is and then this is Courtney and Nico and Nicole. She said, I'm not ready to be in charge of somebody else's life. Right. for, you know, 18 years and, and, you know, be responsible for the woman that messes them, like, <laughs> you know, messes them up and, like, squeezes them around and yeah. stuff, you know? So I was scared for a long time, but as we've gone, it's like they're coming at some point, and so I don't want to be, like, old and not be able to do fun stuff with the kids and don't want them to be like, my dad's 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I don't know, I, and, and so recently, like, my mind has switched, and I'm almost excited to, like, have the challenge of how we balance a kid or kids while we're doing what we're doing, and, like, I think it'll make us better, so let's go for it. That interview was fun because Courtney actually, at that point, had not, at least that she said out loud, was not ready to have kids, and they were, the, they were the flip of us. So Nico was super ready, Courtney was not. Um, Courtney, Jean, Summers, I don't know how many of you know about them, but this is a couple that is younger. Um, they just announced on Instagram yesterday that they are pregnant with their first baby. And we interviewed them like two months ago, three months ago. Um, but they are uh, local, and he owns uh, Marley's and Good Time and Roll Up Creamery. So anyway. They are in the grind. They're in the midst of entrepreneurship. 
Um, what is, well, I'll just take one, one answer for this one. When building a business, what is the ideal work-life balance? This one, clearly, everyone's balance is going to be different. So I just want to hear one of your thoughts for what you feel like is your balance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think having that help, that inspiration from God will be much better and much more effective than just dedicating it all to the business and then using the spare time, oh, maybe I'll read some scriptures, maybe I'll sure. spend time with them. I think the other way around will be much more effective and make a balance. Awesome. So this clip, sorry, got to go back. This clip, and uh, this is the most important one, and then I'll wrap up, uh, is from President Gilbert. He is the president of BYU Pathways, which is an educational startup in, in its own right. Um, and he also was an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial professor at Harvard. One day I got a call, again, one of those uh, 801, 241, 1,000 calls, and, and I said, okay, it's someone from the church, the operator gets online, and she says, this is Clark Gilbert, and I said, yes, and uh, I've got President Packer on the other line, and he'd like to talk to you. So I closed the door, and we've been working on a tricky and delicate issue, and I said, President Packer, are you calling about that? And I said, no, 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 I'm calling about your family. How's your wife? She's good. <laughs> are you paying enough attention to her? Probably not. How late are you working each night? Two or three in the morning every night. President Packer said, do you think this all depends on you? You need to trust the Lord. You also need to focus more on your family. You're going to be working for us for a long time. And maybe like we said earlier, these other things will come and go. But your family's internal. Pay more attention to your wife. Pay more attention to your family. So I love this because he was working for the church, like his boss was President Packer, and he was working at, for Deseret Media at the time, um, and he was doing good things. Like if, if any other entrepreneur has any other, or like any reason to feel like, um, it, like they're doing a good thing with their business, he had it. And he was, he was spending time with the kids when he got home, and then he'd work until 2 or 3 in the morning. And I just love that President Packer said, do you think you're doing this on your own? So to conclude, um, this class, as I understand it, is to inspire you and to give you tools to build successful businesses as entrepreneurs. Uh, marriage might feel like it isn't related, but my my proposal to you, my pitch to you, is that investing in your marriage and in your family will be one of the best investments you make as a business person. What you put into your marriage will come back twofold in what you are able to give to your business. And um, I, I would challenge you to try to be aware of strengths that you and your spouse have to offer to each other in your different realms. and. Um, and make sure to utilize those strengths to build the awesome things that you'll go on to build. Thank you. Thank you, Chandler. Come on.